Today, we're very fortunate to have uh, Ray Rynowski speak with us. Ray was an outdoor writer for magazines, newspapers, and books, as well as a lecturer on uh, Princess Cruises. He no longer is with Princess Cruises. He's retired, so their loss is our gain, because we're very, very fortunate to have him deliver his professional uh, lectures. He's won uh, awards for his books and his articles, and many awards for his photographs. Um, if you're interested in uh, in talking with him about his photographs, he has lots and lots to share, and perhaps some books that you might be interested in looking at. Okay, so today, Ray Rynowski will describe the Panama Canal, one of the new wonders of the world. It's history of human perseverance and sacrifice, it's engineering accomplishments, and the changes that are going to come about as this month, I believe, the new, uh, much larger locks will open. Okay, please welcome Ray Rynowski. Thank you, uh, Noni. I'm going to start out with a quiz. So uh, the questions are, how many of the three original sets of locks use locomotives to guide the ships? How many legislature in Colombia voted against the proposed U.S. Canal uh, Treaty, Panama Canal Treaty? Which of these justified the new Can Panama Canal expansion? It will accommodate larger ships. The demand is greater than the present canal capacity. Uh, canal income for uh, Panama will greatly increase. Oh, this isn't going to be hard, is it? <laughs> so all of the uh, three. Now, the, uh, the new locks will not have uh, locomotives, so that is going to be a whole different situation. I'll talk about that at the end. And... The original treaty on the Panama Canal, pa uh, Panama was part of Colombia, and so the uh, treaty was going to be with Colombia, and they objected to it because it, uh, they would not give up their sovereignty over that part of Panama. And so none of them voted for it. Uh, and all of these do justify, these are the things that uh, justify the new canal. I tried to think of a sentence that would describe the Panama Canal, and so I came up with something, and here it is. The Panama Canal is an extravagant dream on an almost unbelievable scale. Good decisions and bad decisions, failures and successes, deception, lies, and under-the-table dealing, death, lots of death, heroes and villains, international intrigue, formation of a new country, Great engineering on a grandiose scale that is functional 100 years later. How, how, how many items do you know that are, are still functioning well 100 years later? And above all, a triumph that is sometimes called the eighth wonder of the world. The, uh, you think of uh, North America and the South, South America, you know, down below, and North and South to Central America connecting them. Well, it isn't exactly that way. You can see that this is the true North-South map, and... Panama is a lazy S shape, and the Panama Canal right here, which direction do we go as we go from the Pacific to the Atlantic through the Panama Canal? So we're going northwest, actually. You think we're going east in general, but we're going northwest. The Panama Canal looks like this. So I'm going to start up here and talk about the trip through the Panama Canal. Start going through the Gatun locks. Now the uh, Agua Clara locks are will be functional in nine days. Go down through Gatun Lake. Go down here and go through these cuts over to Gamboa and then down to the Centennial Bridge and on down to the Bridge of Americas. We have two sets of locks going out to the Pacific side. The tough part of the uh, construction was right in here. It was through the, the Continental Divide is right here, and the tough part of the construction was through that. So let's talk about going through the, the canal and take a trip through the Panama Canal. So there are three locks. Uh, the 
Gatun Lake is at an 85 foot elevation. Normally it's a little low this year because there's a drought. It will go up to 86 and a half foot uh, to accommodate the new locks. So it's three steps through here. Each step is about a quarter of a mile long, a little bit less. It's 1,050 feet long, so almost a quarter of a mile long. So we had talk, if we had one, two, three steps, we have pier in front, we have a pier behind. So it is about, uh, a little, well, it's over a mile, it's over a mile long. I've gone all the way through the canal here to the Centennial Bridge. This is Gold Hill on the left. And that's where the Continental Divide is, about 560 feet up on the top of the hill. And I'll talk about that later. The new canal, the new uh, part of the canal to the new locks will, is right here, right in this area. And if I just look at that the other direction, it looks like this. And there's the, uh, uh, the uh, Pedro Miguel locks. And the uh, canal, the new uh, canal will come in right through there, almost under the bridge. And then the Bridge of the Americas. That Bridge of the Americas was built in 19, was completed in 1917. The Centennial Bridge was completed in 2014, and that's why it's called the Centennial Bridge. It's 100 years after the first ships went through the Panama Canal. This, uh, the deck on this bridge is 200 feet high, and so with high, considering high tides and other things, they allow ships with an with elevation above water of 190 feet. And that is a a concern to some ships now it is a limitation. So if we talk about the history of the canal, why were people interested in the Panama Canal? Well, if you go from New York to San Francisco like they were doing in the gold rush time, and go the route was all the way around Cape Horn and then up here thirteen thousand miles, nautical miles. And if you could go through the canal, it's five thousand miles. So you save almost eight thousand miles if you're in a, a ship that takes about 14 or 15 days. So it saves a lot of time and of course time is money. And these are the routes through the Panama Canal. So of course a lot of it coming from Europe over and anywhere to the East Coast, well to the West Coast, coming from Asia, Australia, and going through the canal. 6% of the, com the commerce uh, by ship goes through the Panama Canal. First, uh, uh, well, you know that Balboa saw the Pacific Ocean in 1515, I believe is the date, about that time anyway. And so King Charles, in 20 years later, or 19 years later, was interested in building a, a canal across that. It was a narrow section, and so he was interested in building a canal across that isthmus. During the gold rush and before, there were land routes that connected, we were showing, and go across that isthmus. They would go up the Chagos River and then have mules to transport them the rest of the way over to the Pacific and then get another ship going up. And of course, that is kind of the preferred route during the gold rush. The Transcontinental Railroad was, was completed in 1855. So our first Transcontinental Railroad of the Americas, and of course, it was pretty short. So that was uh, candy. Um, so they began studying the Panama Canal seriously and thought about building a canal in like 1870. So this is the, uh, the railroad route, and you can see if we start at the north, it's Monkey Hill up here. The, the canal really goes from here down through here and kind of follows the route of the railroad. So the uh, Continental Divide is right here at Gold Hill, almost to the Pacific side of the so the Panama Canal began as a private, privately funded venture uh, by the French in 1882. And at that time they said, we're gonna do a sea level canal. During the French construction, the 22,500 workers died, mostly from the diseases, yellow fever and malaria. They spent about $300 million, a little less than $300 million. Uh, and they ran out of funding and discontinued work in 1889. They, did they went bankrupt and then another company took it over and so they had a different company owning the Panama Canal rights. Ferdinand de Lesseps was one of the, uh, started out as a hero and kind of ended up as a villain. 
He uh, was an engineer, and he was the one that was responsible for the Suez Canal. And he did a great job on the Suez Canal, and it was a sea level canal. He said, we're gonna do a sea level canal across to Panama. Well, it didn't work out so well. The, uh, he and his son were involved in it. They were not 100% honest, to say the least. They didn't talk about the deaths that we were seeing. They didn't talk about that, hey, we aren't really making progress like we're claiming we're making progress. And so they uh, went, uh, they discontinued the canal. Uh, they were tried, the son went to jail. I think he didn't go to jail, but maybe because he was too old and they let him not be, avoid that. How did this stamp uh, change the canal? The next champion of it, really probably the, the major champion of the Panama Canal was Theodore Roosevelt. And you remember that uh, Theodore Roosevelt, remember the charge of San Juan Hill? of the uh, war of, uh, what was it, 1892 or? Spanish American. Spanish American, okay, thank you. Uh, and he, remember the charge up San Juan Hill? Well, he would have liked to have some Navy support for that, but the Navy was in the Pacific and it would have to go all the way around to South America and get there and take more than two weeks and it was too long. If they'd had the Panama Canal, they could have gone through the Panama Canal and got there in time to be assistant. He was the Secretary of the Navy, and he believed that uh, we needed a strong power to, uh, a strong Navy to be a, a, a world power. At the time, there was a discussion whether the Panama Canal should go through, or the canal should go through uh, Nicaragua or Panama. The Congressional fa uh, Committee favored the, the uh, Nicaragua Canal, and they thought it would cost about two thirds of the Panama Canal. But the representatives of the French company really did a full court press on Congress and the president. There was a, a Philip Benavarro had access to all these people, a great diplomat. And France offered the canal, the rights to the canal and the work that they'd already done to the U.S. for a hundred million dollars. And then they found out that America wasn't going to go for that, the U.S. wasn't going to go for that, so they dropped the price to forty million dollars. <laughs> The Nicaragua Canal would look something like this. It was, the Panama Canal was 53 miles long. The Nicaragua Canal would be about 100 miles longer. But it had some advantages. It had some big rivers that it could go up, uh, like here or here, go through Lake Nicaragua, and then they would have to build a canal over here to drop it down to the ocean. It'd be 107 feet high altitude versus 85 for the Panama Canal. There was an Asian billionaire that came in and bought the rights to do this canal and promised to have it done by uh, 2019. Well, it's it started out good, but it's, it's uh, pretty well in limbo now, so I doubt that it will ever be built, but who knows. With the Panama Canal, you know, I don't see this needed, at least for a while. During the time when they were talking about this in, uh, in uh, 1902, there was an eruption, a volcano eruption in Pele, in Martinique over in the Caribbean islands. It was 1,500 miles away from the canal, but it got people's attention because it killed 30,000 people. There was a uh, eruption in Niagara also. It was 100 miles from the path. It didn't kill anybody. So the proponents of the Panama Canal sent a letter to each of the senators and it had this stamp on it. Now, you can see, what do they show? Well, the prominent feature of Panama, or rather Nicaragua, volcanoes. And so it uh, uh, was designed to scare the senators into saying, okay, we gotta go through Panama, we can't go through Nicaragua. And they voted 42 to 23 for the Panama Canal route. And of course, given that you had the Pan so much work done by the French already, it was probably a good decision. Panama was part of Colombia when this was all started, and so we de uh, developed a, a treaty proposal with the Colombians, and that's when they voted, uh, was zero voted for the treaty. And Panama ceded from Colombia in 1903, they, they were aided by the U.S. and the French, trying to uh, get, get it uh, so that they could get that canal built. And the U.S. had a gunboat in place the only way they could get from Colombia to the Panama Canal to uh, put down the revolt was by sea. And so the U.S. was there and blocking that. So that really did, took care. There, there wasn't a possibility of Colombia doing that. 
and they give uh, Panama Canal the, the rights to this, uh, the U.S. the rights to the Panama Canal for $10 million per year, which is pretty much a pittance. Uh, oh, and that came in late. The, the, the U.S. did make the purchase for $40 million to the rights to the canal from, uh, from uh, France. So let's just go through the Panama Canal. How do you do it? Of course, we're looking at a cruise ship and people up at the front uh, trying to get a good view of the, the uh, Panama Canal, or all of the, the going through the canal. Uh, you start out with this long pier here. Why is that long pier there? Well, the ship goes up and it lines up with the, the, uh, the ship with the, with the pier, so it's straight going into the canal. Now, the canal is 110 feet wide and the ship is 106 feet wide. So you've got two feet on each side, and just the slightest angle, you're going to scrape the, the ship. When I was doing the lectures, one of the, the skipper uh, told me that their, their goal was to get through the canal without uh, scraping the canal. And he said, that, but they don't always do that. Sometimes at the end of the canal, they're out there painting, repainting the stripes on the, on the ship. So it lines up with that pier and then goes through these three steps uh, up to Gatun Lake. Each step is about 28 feet, it's 85 feet total. As you go through the gates, the gates are swing type gates. You can see them over here. They swing back into the wall. You can see over here it is flushed when the gate is in, back in the wall. The way it works is it's all gravity fed. No pumps in doing this. So you're using the water from the lake, and each time you have a transit through the canal, a ship transit through the canal, it takes uh, 53 million gallons of water. And the, the way it happens, you can see here that the water level is high here. This is actually good to lake level, and then it's low here. Now, the way it operates is that they filled this canal from the lake. Uh, they emptied this canal so that this ship is down at its lowest level. It's going to be raised 28 feet, so the level of difference in the water level is, is about 56 feet. And so the water comes from the upper canal, upper locks, and you can see here, it's drained down into the lower locks through a bunch of culverts. And you only open the gates when the uh, canal is yeah, the equal water level on both sides. So it doesn't take much force to open the gates. Now the canal needs to be watertight on the sides, well you can see some water coming through here and here, but it needs to be basically watertight on the sides, at the junction in the middle, and around the bottom, so that the water does not flow to the next canal, to the next chamber until they're ready for it to happen. The locomotives are key to the old canal, they will not be involved in the new canal. So here are the locomotives, they took, uh, attach four to the bow, and uh, two on each side, and then four to the stern, two on each side. We, I have gone through the canal where they use uh, three and one, or rather two and one, so they use six rather than eight locomotives. And the locomotives look like this. This is the third generation locomotives. The very first one for the first canal was made by General Electric. These are made by Mitsubishi. Uh, they're a very structural, they're an industrial uh, quality uh, machine. It has uh, a 265 horsepower engine in the, in the front and the back. Uh, it weighs 50 tons. And as they go from one canal level to the other, they climb up this hill. Well, that's a steep hill. It almost looks like it's a 45 degree angle. Well, it's not that steep, but just but it is very steep. Um, so you, you, how do you climb that uh, steel rail to steel rail? Well, you don't climb that steel rail to steel rail. So it's a cogwheel design, and you can see down here, or actually over here better, you can see the cogwheel goes down into this center track, and that's what drives the, uh, the locomotive. You need it for that, but you also, when you're trying to position the ship, and that's what you're doing with these, is... You don't want that, that uh, locomotive to be sliding back and forth on the rail. You want it to be fixed where, and, and stay where you want it. And so that cogwheel does that too. You use steel cables. Don't want anything that stretches. So you use steel cables and those go and are attached to the ship. So you can see a, a cable from each, the front and the back, 
and they are controlled on the locomotive. They wind them in and out, and that's how they control the, the ship. The locks, the uh, control tower is right here. It's in the center of the, the uh, two locks. Uh, and then over here is an observation point. I've never been there until this last trip. We did an uh, excursion. We saw these locks and then the new locks. And the, our last trip was in June 20th. We were there, or not June, April 20th. So I've been there uh, almost two months ago. As they finish, as they go through the, the uh, locks, the water is released to the chamber below it. But then when you get down to the bottom of the locks, it just is released out into the, or the, the sea level. And so this is the water coming out. The culverts that release the water are 18 feet in diameter, three people standing above, one above the other. So they're big. And there's a lot of water coming out of them, you can see. Uh, this is a Pedro Miguel lock, and it could be any lock. This is, it does have a single chamber, but what I wanted to point out is the rowboat right here. How are you doing with a rowboat in the Panama Canal? <laughs> so they bring out, and you can see here, they have their four locomotives that will uh, guide the ship, and they bring uh, lines out from the locomotives. They're, they're dealing with their lines. And you can get a, a scale of how big the uh, ship is versus the, the rowboat. And this is the bow of the ship, and you know this is the underwater part. They use this this structure, that uh, bulbous structure, increases the efficiency by about six or seven percent. So you get a, a higher speed and you get better fuel economy. So it's really important. For virtually all the ships have those. They throw the lines from the ship down to the. Uh, rowboat, you can see that that one's hitting the water right there, and then there's one up here that's just been tossed down, and that's the end of that line. So then they attach the, the lines they're holding to those lines, and then pull it onto the ship, and then they attach it to uh, bollards on the ship. An important uh, feature is as they're aligning the ship, they have a uh, have tugboats. On, to align the ship. Now the cruise ships, they're going in and out of ports all the time, and they have side thrusters, and so you don't need all of the, those tugboats particularly. But uh, the regular ships, that's how they do it. They don't go to port very often, and that's the way they get aligned. So that aligns it so they're going straight into the canal. But the yeah, ships, the, it's not the locomotives that power this, the ship through the canal. They it's the, only, the, the power of the ship that makes them go through the canal. And this, the locomotives align them and center them, but, and they, uh, they stop them too. I mean, you don't want that locomotive, or you don't want that ship that, uh, uh, like the, the cruise ship that we go on is 92,000 tons, you don't want that crashing into the wall, even at slow, or the gate, even at slow speed. So, so this is a Panamax ship. It's 106 feet wide. It's going on a 110 foot wide chamber. It's 965 feet long, and the chamber is 1,050 feet long. And so there's enough room to open the doors, uh, the gates. So the draft that's allowed was 39.6 feet, although now it's not. It's like 38 feet because the Katuna Lake is low. And they, uh, they can be 190 feet above the water line, the, the tallest structure on the ship. The uh, new locks will allow passage of much larger ships, and we'll talk about that in a minute. So these are the types of vessels that go through a little bit of everything. But the top, well, the, the, the most prevalent are the uh, container uh, ships. The third is car carriers, which was a surprise to me. The second is bulk carriers. So this is a car carrier, and then this is a different car carrier, but I wanted to show you that this is the ramp that they drive the uh, cars on and off. And they, it's a RORO ship, R-O-R-O, -R -O, roll on, roll off. So they drive the cars on and off. They will come to a port. This ship can hold uh, the biggest ships that go through the present canal, 5,500 cars and the ones that go through the new locks will be able to hold 8,000 cars they have one scheduled to go through the early in the system and they can drive off they'll go to different ports to unload their cars 
but they will only say they're less than 24 hours because they get charged extra if they don't. And it's so efficient, they just, I mean, I can visualize those cars just zipping off and on and the ship. So Gatun Lake, this is a spillway, and it's a earthen dam. Most of the uh, earth or the material for it came from Gatun Lake, or not Gatun Lake, the uh, uh, Galliard Cut. Uh, and so it was tra uh, moved here by train. Uh, Chagres River is here, and this is a bridge at Gamboa. But it has uh, car traffic one way, then stops and goes the other way, and train traffic. So it's all all goes across here. The canal is 53 miles long. It raises the ship 85 feet in three locks. Average about 38 big ships each day. And typical transit takes eight to 10 hours. So they go in one side in the morning, go out the other side. And the other thing about it is they're always, in the morning they're going towards the center of the lake, and then at the evening they go back, or, or in the afternoon they go on through. So it's you know I see well two chambers, one's going one way, one the other. No, they all you know they're all going in and then all going out. So it's two boats wide. It started out at 300 feet wide. It was improved to 500 feet wide, and now with the new expansion, it's up to 900 feet wide. So the original construction looked like this. This is a French excavator. And you can see it brings material up here, dumps it in a, a train car, and then you know moves it along back and forth. When they get that material out of the way, they move the tracks over and continue working on it. There were three engineers during the construction, and the first one was John Wallace, and he, he did some things. Uh, he was there a couple of years, and then John Stevens came in. He was there from 1905 to 1907, and he made the major decisions, the really good decisions, he was uh, worked for, uh, for a railroad company, and he saw this as a, a moving material, and it basically was. You know, you had to get that material out of the uh, cuts that they were making at the, the Caliba uh, Lake, or, or uh, Channel, not Lake. Here are the, some of the decisions he made. He halted construction and built the infrastructure. He wanted, you know, better roads, better buildings. Panama gets... 100 to 200 inches of rain per year, typically. So there's, it's a, it's a pretty wet place. Now, as you go through on the cruise ship, we're in the dry season, and you get hardly any. But during the summer season, when we're not doing cruises, then it's wet. Uh, he uh, had a change to the uh, locks. He made that change. He said, you just can't bring that extra 85 feet down and make this work efficiently or, or economically. And he gave Dr. William Gargas a uh, free hand to eradicate mosquitoes. And of course, that was a real thing that uh, uh, took away the, uh, or solved the, the uh, diseases, yellow fever and malaria that they were having. So in 1905, the, Congress, the senators changed, uh, voted by six votes to change to the locks. In doing that, they made the world's largest artificial lake, at Gatun Lake. Uh, and that held until the Hoover Dam in, 19, in, the, in the 1930s. And the lake provides enough water to uh, raise and uh, lower the ships, but it takes an average, uh, well, they have an average of about 100 or more inches of rain, depending on where you are, and it takes 53 million gallons of water for each transit in and out. Dr. Gargas worked with Walter Reed, remember Walter Reed Hospital, and they're the ones that discovered that, hey, this is the, the mosquitoes what is, uh, are uh, causing the, the malaria and yellow fever. And so uh, he uh, controlled it in, in Cuba, and then they came to the Panama Canal Zone, and they were controlled it there. And so, of course, that more or less solved the problem. Those are some of the things that he did to control mosquitoes. Um, the uh, Calibra cut... In 1904, you can see, I think there's like seven levels of railroads there, and there, we're now using steam shovels rather than the, what the French were using, but it was, looks like that. And I don't see the steam shovels, actually. So this is what the, the French did. This is the contour of the hill from Gold Hill down to here. 
And what the French did is they took a lot of material out. They got that material, took that out, and then the U.S. went in and took the rest of it out to complete the canal. That's uh, President Roosevelt, and he was in 1906, and he was the first president to go outside the United States as an acting president. The third engineer was uh, George Washington Gothels, and he had a long term, but he was a um, uh, army engineer, and so he didn't have a choice to resign or not resign. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of slides. There were 22 major slides in the Cleaver Cut. And in 1914, when they opened the canal, they were still excavating, taking care of slides that had happened. The gates are like this, and they are, let's see, up to 100 feet tall. That's not the exact number. They're 65 feet wide. Each gate is 65 feet wide, and they're seven foot thick. And you can see the way they're made with a, a structure and then a uh, skin on the outside. The chamber, the locks look like this. Uh, the 18 foot diameter culverts are here and here. So there's, there's one lock chamber here and then one on the other side over here. And you can see passageways and controls and, and so on here. And then the water comes from one chamber into the next or from the lake or wherever. And it goes, is bubbled up and bubbled up isn't quite the right term uh, that through these, uh, uh, ports on the bottom of the chamber. So during the construction, you move 512 million cubic yards of material, and that's like 100 uh, times the volume of the largest Egyptian pyramids. They used 61 million pounds of dynamite, and that was more than was used on all wars prior to that time. They poured 2 million cubic yards of concrete and if we're thinking of like an eight yard, eight cubic yard truck, that's 250,000 uh, trucks. And you can string them across the U.S. from New York to, uh, to San Francisco, and you pretty much fill the highway in doing that. The uh, Calibra Cut was the place that was really the challenge because it had a lot of material you had to remove to get down to the canal level. Uh, they had 50 to 60 steam shovels, and they uh, trains hauled the debris to the, mostly to the Gatun Dam to start with, and then other places too. There were 50,000 workers. Oh, and they, uh, during the construction, they would haul as many as 165 train loads of material per day. It was amazing. Uh, and then during the cons U.S., there were 5,600 people that died to add to the French uh, deaths. The U.S. construction cost 352 million. And be adding the total cost was up $639 million. And of course, that was real money at that time. <laughs> so the U.S., of course, operated the canals up until they uh, transitioned uh, in, uh, that was in the 1960s or 70s when they agreed to turn it over to Panama. And so they took over entirely in 2000. And, uh, so they've been making improvements, they've been doing a good job with it. If you don't have a reservation, you would, might have to wait as much as a week to get into the canal. They accept 27 reservations per day. You pay a 10% premium to get a reservation. They also have one slot per day that they auction off to the highest bidder. And, you know, I can imagine that could go pretty high if somebody's got something that's got to be there and uh, they're going to pay whatever it takes to get it through. So the new locks. Now we went on April to see the the uh, canal, and I was hoping that we'd see uh, uh, ships and the new locks, but we didn't. There were this was the state of it. Uh, and I looked there, and I was, I'm not very impressed. You know, there's no locomotives, or not much anything. There's a lot of structure out there, a lot of things, a lot of things underneath. You one thing that's really impressive about it is each of these chambers is a quarter of a mile plus 80 feet. So they're long and they're 180 feet wide. So you can see there's three of them. Two, one, two, uh, let's see, one, two, three, I guess. The reason they built this was it went to the vote for the Panamanian people to increase this 
they were running out of space. The old locks had two issues with it. One is they were too small for the modern ship, and the other is they were full. They couldn't handle all the traffic that was, uh, was demanding those locks. So the Panamanians voted in 2006. They had a 78% favorable vote. Uh, estimated cost is 5.25 million. You know, they've had some delays. It's probably more than that. I don't know if it's a, a big increase. And they used, moved about 55 million cubic yards of material, which is like one tenth of the original, what they moved for the original construction. And they would be completed in 2014. Well, of course, you know, they weren't. But they are scheduled to open on June 26th. Ray? Uh huh. On our Coast Guard tour last week, they told us that it is now open. Well, it's officially not open. Oh, okay. They are running test ships through it. On June 9th, they started running test ships through it. Oh, okay. But uh, it, it opened, it has its grand opening on June 26th for commercial use. And so this is what they look like. And the uh, Gatun side, the uh, Agua Clara locks on the Gatun side, and that just kind of parallels the, uh, the original locks. Now, on the Pacific side, you know, they have the, uh, the two sets of locks. Uh, the Pedro Miguel is one chamber and then two chambers down here, just kind of following the natural contour of the land. Uh, Bear Flores Lake is in between. Now, what they've done is gone up the hill from where the original locks are a little bit and put in this whole new set of locks. There are three chambers. There's some extra there, I'll talk about that in a minute. And then they put in this canal, which is at lake level from here to here. You know, this in here is below lake level, so they built some dikes between the two to separate the two channels. The Panamax sized ships were 1,050 feet long. The, the Neo Panamax are 14, 1,400, 10, uh, 1,050 and 1,400. The width 110 and use a could put a 106 foot wide ship through it. The Neo Panamax are 180 feet wide and they can put a 160 foot wide <coughs> ship through it. So they have 10 feet on each side. Depth was 41 feet and now they're going to a depth of 60 feet. If you compare the old vessels and the new vessel, well, this is the profile view of it, but the top view here. Look, this is the old ship, this is the new one. So there's a lot more capacity there, and the new ship will hold two and a half times as many uh, containers. And how does this affect the income on the Panama Canal? Well, this is showing the, when it was supposed to be open in uh, 2014, that the, about that time we're gonna have about 1.5 billion per year income, and they projected that in 11 years they have almost 45, 4.5 billion. So a factor of three times the income. Now, this, the canal provides about 40% of the income for the, the Panama uh, government. And I don't know how that will change as we go up here, but it's a very big, significant part of their income. I just took a few pictures as we went along. So this is March, 2011. This is right under this, the Centennial Bridge and you can look down here. This is the new, uh, new uh, canal, new uh, part of the canal, and they're digging that out to get it down to the 60-foot depth that they need. And then uh, in October, so it wasn't too long after that, they now, I'm a little closer, but they've dug it out to, I assume that's the 60-foot level. And I like the picture, I like the, the, the uh, dust in the picture, so I, that's one of the reasons I had to include that. <laughs> The uh, 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 part of a year later, six months later, then they had opened that up, and this is then beyond that, and looking towards the uh, Bridge of the Americas. Straight shot to the Bridge of the Americas. Of course, they had big trucks, and I'm not gonna spend much time on this, uh, and they had mega dredges. This one was built in uh, 2077, uh, and it is the biggest dredge of this type in the world. If you look at the bucket, it is 15 feet wide, and I calculate that you can put the bucket down on the ground, you can drive three small cars into it side by side. Wow. So now, uh, coming to the other end, as we went through the canal uh, in, in April, uh, 
you can see that over here is where the old canal is, is uh, working. And you can see, of course, it's functioning. Over here is the new canal. So you just turn left or turn right, the canals pretty much parallel each other. So the new canal looks like this. You can see there's one, two, three gates that uh, are the three steps. It has a pier out in front of it on this end, but not at the other end. And it looks like this. Uh, the gates are rolling gates. And I'll show those in a minute. This is a control tower here, so they can see into the lake and see what's going on. If it isn't foggy, and uh, then they can see what's going on. Uh, and so there are the chambers. They, it takes a lot of water, you know, 53 million gallons of water to put a ship through the canal, and they're using the water. They have a, uh, uh, they have a lot, but they have a limited supply. So the new chambers would take uh, 2.18 times as much water to, to make it happen, just because the chamber is so much bigger. They, so what they've done is got water savers, and what the way they work is that the uh, water from when they're getting ready to lower this ship, this top part of water goes over into this chamber, and it's all gravity fed. This one over here, this one to here, and then when they get the ship out, and, they, and then the other, the bottom two goes into the just downstream. Uh, when they get the ship through and another ship in, then they. Uh, put this water in the lower chamber, this one the next, and so on, and then they have to put the, that much water from the lake. So that's how much they use. And by this savings, they're able to uh, save 7% for transit. So it takes less water with the transit of the new lock versus the old locks. And the gates are like this, and they're rolling gates, and it goes that way, I'll show you in a, in a minute. But we, you drive across these, they're 30 feet wide, and the, you know, the, the, the canal is 180 feet wide, so these are big. The uh, gates for the original canal, there are two of them, but they're like uh, 65,000 ton. Let's see, yeah, 65,000, no, six, 650 tons gates. And these are up to 4,000 ton gates. So that, that gate, one of those gates can weigh as much as 4,000 tons. And they go into these chambers and in and out. They have two at each position, and there's a couple of reasons for that. Uh, one is that they can uh, operate the canal. They have, a, have to work on a gate. They can keep operating the canal, use the one gate, and then fix the other one. And, then, and so that. Uh, another reason is for safety. You can imagine that if you have these gates open in the wrong position, you could drain the lake. You know, you got the 28-foot uh, uh, step there, and you could drain that lake by 28 feet if you don't. If all of those gates fa failed, it takes three gate failures at a time. But it's uh, you know you you've got to think about that. And this is a gate about half open, and then the rest of the way you can see the two gates, this one and this one. And you know we're talking about that it was critical to get this alignment. Well, it's really critical with a new one because uh, you, you don't have the, uh, uh, the locomotives to align you. What you have is you have tugboats. So this is, of course, not the right place. But you have a tugboat on the, stir on the bow, you have a tugboat off the stern. And they're the ones that are taking you through the locks. You're powering it through the locks. It's not that they're doing that, but they're guiding you. And then you have two tugboats on the side that will get you aligned. As soon as you're aligned and you start through the locks, then those two tugboats are gone. There isn't space for them. And this is a picture of uh, the June 9th when they had the first ship going through. Uh, and they've rented a ship. And it's 141 feet wide. It's not the 160 feet wide, but it's well past the, the original Panamax ship. You can see the original tugboat in the bow. There would be one that's hidden here. And then the two that assisted them. You can see the water chambers, and it looks to me like this is the higher level water chamber, and this is the lower level. But that, uh, the, so there are the water chambers that save the water, and you have one of those with, with each, uh, each lock. So the new locks open on, Jan, on June 26, 20, well, of course, this year, and it is a televised event. If you want to get more information, this uh, Canal de Panama 
is the official location for the, for the canal. And if you'll go to their website, you'll get a lot of information, including uh, a uh, video of the first ship going through. Uh, it's supposed to open to, to cruise ships about a year from now. Now, if I think about it and say, well, somebody asked me, well, which locks would I like to go through? I'd say the old ones, for our sake, there's so much more to see. See the locomotives, there's so much more to see. Uh, and these, they, put, they come into a chamber, they tie up, they you know, raise the water level or lower the water level, then do that in three steps to get through the chamber. But you bring it in, you, you tie it up, and then you, you raise it. And if you want to get more information, there's a The Path Between the Seas. It's just a wonderful book. I kind of read the first half of it because that was the French part. I would say, well, that was really interesting. I don't know if I want to read that. It's a huge book. So I don't know if I want to read the second. But then you've got to start reading the second. You can't put it down. So it's uh, something. I do have an extra copy. If somebody wants to borrow it, they're welcome to it. And there is a, a copy of this in the library. So the Panama Canal, one of the world's greatest engineering accomplishments. So I'd be glad to take <coughs> questions or see if I can answer some of them. Thank you very much. The question is, will they keep the old canal going? And yes, you know, this is increase the capacity. And by the way, there will be one, <coughs> one ship go through the canal the first day, four ships the next day, and they're going to leave it at four. Now the old canal, they're getting like 18 ships through each channel, so, and they expect to get up to like 10 to 12 ships per channel going through here. So it's not a huge, you know, you're not just putting a lot of ships through it, it's just they're a lot bigger. Over here. This is still true that waters from the Atlantic and the Pacific never been. That's what I was told when I went through the canal. Yeah, I guess that's true because it's always going from the Gatun Lake down, and so it goes one way or the other, so they don't mix. What keeps the ships from hitting the sides if they go through? They, well, it's the tugboats steering them. Yeah. They, the sides have bumpers on them. It's a permanent bumper. So if they hit the sides, they've got some cushioning. But, so I'm sure that's a, a nice safety feature. Does somebody over here have one? Who designed the new canal? Who designed the new canal? You know, they did contracts to whoever they thought could do it. And it's foreign people that are doing it. It's not so much Panamanian. The Panamanians do the overseeing and they do a, a most of the construction, but it's not so much that. Oh, I, should, I forgot to mention that there's one place in the world where the pilot of the ship, the, capper, the skipper of the ship, gives up control of his ship, and that's in the Panama Canal. Only one place in the world. That's true with the old canal, it'll be true with the new canal. But these, these pilots are well trained, uh, they know the idiosyncrasies of the canal, and you know, that's kind of, yeah, I'd really rather have them do it than this. Skipper that go through once a month or something. Or, yeah. How long did it uh, take to build a new canal from start? To it, two thousand. Is there a price tag? Two thousand seven, and the original price tag was five billion dollars, or five point two five billion dollars. About the same as the Bay Bridge, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. Was that how much was it? It was that. No yeah. kidding. That was that. Amazing. Yeah. George? Ray, any idea cost the, the, for a ship? What what fee? Oh yeah, that's an, I should have had, answered that question. For a cruise ship, it's about uh, three hundred thousand dollars for a transit, and in your in the fees for your cruise ship, you're going to be paying about one hundred and sixty-five dollars per person to to as part of the, those fees. Ray, isn't there a, uh, a surcharge by going through a day versus night? Uh, in other words, it's more expensive for uh, the question is that go through it in the daytime, so you can see going through. But if you went through at night, there'd be a lesser charge. Well, he's, uh, Bob's asking if there's a surcharge if you go through during the day versus the night, and I think there's a safety issue on that. I don't know about you know it costs a lot of money, but it's. Uh, uh, I'm not sure that there's a, the surcharge. I just don't know to tell you the truth on that. So, who was Pedro Miguel? I don't know, but there was a town named that. Yeah, don't know. Or Mayor Floyd. Did fish ever have an impact in in transporting the water from one area 
to another? Well, it's interesting that fish that were only found in the Atlantic are now in the Pacific, so they have gone through the canal. Uh, the tarpon and snook, uh, the, not too many of them, but they go through the canal. Free. Yeah, free. They don't, they don't pay. <laughs> the, the lowest price anybody paid going through the canal was uh, a, they, a, a, when it first was ready to open, a swimmer went through it. And, and he paid 36 cents, I think is the right number. <laughs> So why is it they don't need the, the locomotives anymore? Well, you know, their locomotives are expensive. It takes an operator to every locomotive. Uh, and, you know, so it's an expense issue. Uh, and they, they don't need them because they have a 10-foot clearance. They have bumpers, you know, and they have the tugboats to, to help them. One of those old shuttles is parked in northern Chile in front of a copper mine called Chukicamata. And they bought the shovel to do the mining for them, as a second-hand piece of equipment. <laughs> okay, the shuttle. You mean the locomotive? No, no, the shovel. shovel. The shovel. Oh, the shovel. Oh, okay. Okay, yeah. Now, you know, there's that, the, uh, the shovels they use on land, they're pretty big, but they're not like in a mine. Man, the people in the mines, I mean, they're three or four times as big, the, or the capacity of, in a... You're using in you know, these open pit mining. It's unbelievable. Did they have to dredge the lake, or is it deep enough? Did they have to dredge the lake? Yeah, they did. You know, and of course there are places where it was fine, but uh, there was a lot of dredging and along the Culebracot. I mean, that was even as you're going out. But you know, you got the, the uh, uh, Continental Divide, and then you're kind of going downhill in general towards uh, Gatun, and so there are places there that it was okay. Uh, but but it's you know it, it's a continuous thing. They do dredging uh, around the clock. Well, I don't go around the clock, but around the year anyway. Uh huh. Anything? You were saying that Gatun Lake was a little low. Right. Are they having a problem with water? What what is happening is uh, it's uh, El Nino year. Mm -hmm. El Nino years they don't get as much rainfall down there, oh. and so they're having a problem now. You know, they're going to raise the lake level by 1.5 feet, but they got to get the rain to fill that level or it isn't going to do them any good. Texas is getting all the water. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's El Nino. I don't know. Everything changes in El Nino. So are you going back? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I doubt that I will, tell you the truth. I, I'd kind of like to go through one more time, but I don't know that I will. Yeah, uh, 18. <laughs> well, I was giving lectures, you know, and I do two or three a year for six years. Okay, well, thank you very much.